I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome you to worship this Sunday morning at Monfort Heights United Methodist Church. For those who are joining us online, we welcome you as well. And I invite everyone to fill out a Connect card, one of these. We've got them also available online as well. And for any of you who are guests, a special word of welcome to you. So just a few announcements to share this morning. We are um, starting a new ministry here, and it's called Visiting Prayer. We have been doing outreach with our those folks who are unable to attend with us in person by visiting in their homes or visiting at different institutions. And that uh, Joyce Green has helped with that, clergy have helped with that. And uh, but we're trying to expand and to begin sharing our Holy Communion each month with folks. Uh, and maybe not every month, but at least more frequently than we've been sharing communion. And then also visiting to share with prayer. So if you'd like to be part of a, a new team that's starting up, a new ministry, Greg and Gail Davis are leading this, and we'll do our first training on Tuesday, September 17th, uh, so about 10 days from now, on I in uh, room 124 downstairs at 4 p.m., so Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in a week. So we encourage you to, to look at that. Um, also, we'll show with you share with you that we got some food out for the, the band at Coleraine High School. Last Friday night, and we had it, and they had it. We had a good night. Um, thank you to everyone who helped with that. Now we're getting ready to help not the band this week, but we're helping the football team this week. So I encourage you all to pick up something out there to help out. Maybe make a, a tray of food, or maybe bring some salads or desserts or all kinds of stuff. It's all out there in the gathering space. Just pick up what you want to bring, and and uh, and instructions are in the bulletin. We're also starting a campaign called Do Unto Others, and along with about 20 churches in the Cincinnati area, uh, you may have noticed that there is an election coming in November. Have you noticed that? A few ads for that and all those things. Well, we believe that uh, you know everybody is, in, is encouraged to participate in our democratic process, and uh, we want to remember that our church brings everyone together. And we want to bring our community together. And it's an important time. And it's an important time for us to encourage kindness and humility and uh, ability to, to, to share with each other in this, this democratic process. So we are putting up these graphics with do unto others. Uh, it's, a, it's a heart in the midst of uh, blue and red with uh, some purple there together, reminding us that we're all coming together and that we need to be able to do this together in a harmonious way. So we're the signs are going to have do unto others on one side and then Monfort Heights United Methodist Church on the other side. We encourage you to take them and put them in your yard. Um, they're $10 each. Well, there's more information in the bulletin about that, and we will soon, we, we have also just gone live with a, a giving means on through our website to give through Vanco, and you'll be able to also pay for the signs in about in sometime this week, I think we'll get that up up and running. But um, if you want to sign, just let us know. We've ordered, I think, 30, and we'll see if we can where we go with that. We'll get here about the 20th of September. We hope to do this in October, and then to November. And um, there are signs that you know you can save and then use for the next election, um, because we we always need to be reminded that we need to be kind to each other and do unto others as as we would have them do unto us. Well, there are many other announcements in the bulletin. Um, I do want to share that there is a Bible study starting back up this fall, and that's the Doing Bible Study at 10 a.m. on Monday mornings. They don't. They meet. Um, they'll be meeting tomorrow in the library downstairs. And then Tap into Faith is our, you know, the second and the fourth Monday. Uh, we we have tap, tap into Faith at Westside Brewing, so invite you to be a part of that as well, and invite neighbors and friends. With that being said, uh, let us join in prayer and the call to worship. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather this morning to focus on uncommon wisdom and the wisdom that you bring us through Proverbs and through your scriptures. As we focus on your wisdom, may we allow our wisdom to be inspired by you. 
And may we come together to worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. Welcome, beloved. Why have you gathered to why, why have you gathered today? We have come to worship God, who is the maker of us all. We seek God's wisdom to guide us and show us how to live. What do you seek from God, our Creator? We seek God's wisdom to guide us and show us how to live. Are you ready to follow when God's wisdom leads down unexpected paths? We will trust and we will follow wherever God's wisdom leads us. Well then, beloved of God, what are you waiting for? Come, Come let, let us worship, worship and seek God's uncommon wisdom together. Amen. Let us worship. comes down to this what you require of me love my neighbor as myself in you above all things act justly love mercy walk humbly with you God Walk on me with you, God, in all things, in all ways. Walk on me with you, God. It's beauty for ashes, it's morning to dancing. It's closer and closer, the kingdom of heaven. It's beauty for ashes, it's morning to dancing. It's closer. Should I open it? Oh, should I open it now or wait? Open it. Is it orange pants? Where are those orange pants, by the way? She was dyeing pants orange yesterday. I'm not even listening. <laughs> the world needs some more people like you. <laughs> Aww. Beautiful. Did you guys make this? amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Tell Matt, will you tell Maddie I said thank you? Yeah. She's at home. Yeah, we have Sundays like that, right? Hi. Okay, so today um, I was curious if you've ever asked for advice. Have you ever had to ask for help on something? A lot, a lot, a lot. 
Have you ever had to ask for help? Yeah. What are some examples? When do we ask for advice and when do we ask for help? Can you think of anything? In math? Yeah. Yeah, that's a oof. You do not like math? I'm not a fan either. There are some weirdos in this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> some people like math. It's not my thing either. Yeah. When do you have to ask for help, Isabel? You ask help from your mom? Yeah. This was the, um, sometimes I would get this advice from my dad. Not now, Kelly. You've heard that? And you, so then you know when it happens, right? It's when you really want something and you just keep pushing and asking. And his advice was not now. Sometimes I listened. Sometimes I just kept on going. You know, I'm not a quitter. So, um, yeah, there's that. Here's a piece of advice that I sometimes give um, my children, um, but I would also give my students. If you don't have time to do it right, you must have time to do it again, right? Students like hearing that from their teacher. Yeah, they always appreciated that one. So we ask people who we, um, we respect, right? Moms, dads, teachers, grandparents, right? Good friends, that's who we ask for help from, right? But we have a really good source of help right here. So I was thinking that we could look in our Bibles today and just a couple examples of how God gives us good advice on how to live, okay? All right, this first one uh, right here, it's in the book of Exodus. You might, you might be familiar with um, some things in Exodus, probably more than you, than you know. Um, but this is one of them. You shall not steal. Does that seem like a good thing to do? That's good advice, right? Should we take things from other people? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you mean that. You don't take things from other people, right? I mean, I know it's wrong. Like, I'm not going to take a car or someone's dog just because it's cute, right? What if I showed up to your house and be like, ah, I was there when you got Maddie, so I'm just going to just take her, <laughs> right? Yeah, that would hurt somebody's feelings. <laughs> that would hurt somebody's feelings, right? Yeah, so, so okay, that's a good one. But what about, what about when after our mom says no more cookies? Are you? I know. I can't even believe it, right? And and she, and then she walks away. And there's one cookie left sitting there. If I take that cookie, do you think it counts? Oh, all right, fine. Okay, do not steal. Okay, here's another one. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. It says, a generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. That's good advice, right? Being generous is a blessing, and you get to be blessed when you share. Yeah, yeah. Sharing's okay, right? Like, if I had five pieces of candy in my hand, and I gave you one and you one, and then I had three, that counts, right? Okay. See, I like her. I like her. <laughs> what do you think, Declan? That's good enough sharing? At least I gave you something? Okay. But not Brooks. We won't share with him. No. Okay. I think God would say, mmm, you should probably share with everyone. He's not much for candy. Oh, that's, okay. Well, then that's good. That's good. Then I don't have to worry about him. And I've been thinking about it, though. I thought, well, these seem a little hard sometimes, like not taking that last cookie. And, and the Old Testament's so full of, like, rules and regulations and numbers. I thought, surely it gets easier in the New Testament, right? So, so I went here. I went to here, to the book of Luke. I'm in Luke. And in Luke, it says... Forgive so that you can be forgiven. I don't know if I like that advice, right? I have to forgive everybody? Yeah, everybody? Even the person who takes my toys at school? Even the person who ran their cart into me in the grocery store parking lot? We should talk it out, and then maybe I could find forgiveness. 
or report them to the police. <laughs> or, we, well, we could go with both, actually, right? It would not be a pleasant occurrence, right? Especially if they did it and walked away. Mm, that would make me so mad. I don't know about that. Okay, one more, one more. Let's see if this one gets easier. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, that's pretty easy, right? I mean, I love everybody like Jesus loves everybody. I'm so pleasant all the time, right? Oh, we're back to the cookie. Okay, well, clearly you need to open up to the book of John because you're not loving well enough when you're not sharing the cookie. All right? That's a hard one, right? But it's all advice for how we're supposed to live. And unlike me not listening to my dad and going forward, right, on the not now, Kelly, or unlike me taking my time and doing it right the first time, the things in our Bible, they're not negotiable. God's advice is pretty good advice. But there's really no reason to steal. And there's really no reason not to forgive. So I just think that when we have hard decisions coming up in our life and we have to choose what we want to do, if we can ask people in our lives, we should probably also ask God to see what he thinks about it. Sometimes the answer becomes very clear. Very clear. <laughs> very quickly. There we go. Okay, let's say a prayer, and then we'll get some fruit. How's that? Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Dear God, thank you for this day, and thank you for the words of wisdom and the advice that you have offered so many generations. Help us remember to go to you first, and then ask around what other people think. We love you so much. Thank you for loving us. And the whole family said, Amen. Amen. Well, I don't have cookies, but I do have fruit. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Back here in the deal. Okay. I missed the memo on uh, the Bengals garb for the day, but I did wear black. Oh, and Tracy's got it? All right. It's great. And um, we're excited. We're, we're going to Monday Night Football in a couple of weeks. All right. Tracy grew up. She, f she went to the first Bengals game here and went all through several, several seasons for many years. So we're happy to be back in, in the midst of the Bengals world. All right. A um, couple things to, to share with you beyond Bengals. We're looking at uncommon wisdom today. And the first reading is from Proverbs. Proverbs is a book of sayings, of, of wisdom. A good reputation is better than much wealth. High esteem is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord God made them both. Those who sow injustice will harvest evils. The rod of their fury will come to an end. Happy or generous people because they give some of their food to the poor. Don't steal from the poor because they are poor. Don't oppress the needy in the gate. The Lord will take up their case and press the life out of those who oppress them. Here ends the reading of God's word for our understanding. The second lesson is from Mark, the seventh chapter, verses 24 through 37. And this is uh, the stories of, of Jesus and his travels between Tyre and Sidon, which is north of, of Israel, up on the, the Mediterranean Sea. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know that he had entered a house, but he couldn't hide. In fact, a woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. 
she came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, Syrophoenician at, by birth. She begged Jesus to throw the demon out of her daughter. He responded, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But she answered, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Good answer, he said. Go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. When she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. After leaving the region of Tyre, Jesus went through Sidon towards the Galilee Sea through the region of the Ten Cities. Some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged him to place his hand on the man for healing. Jesus took him away from the crowd by himself and put his fingers in the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Looking into heaven, Jesus sighed deeply and said, Afatha, which means open up. At once his ears opened. His twisted tongue was released, and he began to speak clearly. Jesus gave the people strict orders not to tell anyone. But the more he tried to silence them, the more eagerly they shared the news. People were overcome with wonder, saying, He does everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who can't speak. And Siri just decided that it's time to speak. So I am trying to, um, Siri, turn off. All right. Let's see, let me just mute my sound here. There we go. We're good to go now. All right. So many curious things have happened with me, with, with Siri along the way. One Sunday, it was just crazy music that was totally inappropriate for <laughs> worship. It just came on. All right. I was closing everything, trying to get out, and I closed my sermon, too. <laughs> All right, let's pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word and how you continue to speak to us and to bring wisdom into our lives. Lord, we continue to need your wisdom to face each day unafraid and to follow your way of love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is the second Sunday in our series on Uncommon Wisdom. And we're exploring the wisdom today of, of literature in our Bible through Proverbs. Proverbs is a collection of wisdom sayings. And, and many of these sayings are attributed to King Solomon. And then it talks about some other sources that Solomon gathered and gives some of their sources. Many are attributed to King Solomon, and some were taken from these other sources and compiled into this collection. So our theme this week is choosing how we shall live. You know, as we think about this uncommon wisdom, how will we live with that wisdom in our lives? Today we're looking at how we live with resources, both when they're plentiful and how we live with resources when they are scarce. So in a Forbes article from April of 2024, it's reported that 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So yeah, basically, you know, you have what you need, or, or maybe not, Maybe you don't have everything you need, but you're just, you need that next paycheck. And in this research, they said only about 20% of the respondents, so 78% live paycheck to paycheck. The other 20% above had $2,000 or more in savings, so they could face some kind of emergency. 
But those living paycheck to paycheck, it becomes more difficult to deal with an emergency. Another interesting piece with all this is Pew Research Center found that in the U.S. in 2023, 30% of the population in the U.S. is low income, meaning unable to meet all their expenses. 51% are middle income, they're meeting their expenses. And then 19% are upper income with wealth and ability to sustain at some level themselves if not receiving a paycheck. So we as a church, we have people, I'm sure, from all those areas. Um, as a community, we have people from all of those areas. So how, does the, how do the Proverbs speak to us? How do they bring us wisdom as we look at resources, at wealth and need, all those things? The first one that we looked at was attributed to King Solomon. Something, a, a collection of sayings that he probably left for one of his children, for his children um, to have. And it says this, a good reputation is better than wealth. High esteem is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. Now here's how I understand that. The first value we learn in this is that God made us all. We all have worth, and that worth is the same. Our worth is not based on our bank account. And with that, what we do is more important than how much wealth we have. How people view us should be based on our reputation from what we do and not based on our wealth. So how we look at others, too, should be based on what they do and their reputation and how we think of them, not, not thinking of them based on their wealth. So in other words, we should not value people with wealth more highly than people without wealth. And alternatively, we should not undervalue those who are under-resourced, poor, because they have fewer resources. We should see people with all, all having the same worth and then look at their actions to make further judgments. The second couplet we read in Proverbs is also attributed to King Solomon in the same group of writings. And he wrote, those who sow injustice will harvest evil. The rod of their fury will come to an end. Happy or generous people because they give some of their food to the poor. So one interpretation of this is that you know, those who are unfair and try to extort money from others who have less will harvest evil, that the rod of their fury and what they're doing will come to an end. I was thinking about reading today a, a devotion, and, and Zacchaeus was the, the, the person in that story, the scripture story of Zacchaeus. He's a, a person who took more than was due him as a tax collector. He took more than was due from others. He basically took advantage of his power to take from those who had less to add to his own benefit. But after an encounter with Jesus, he decided to restore money to those he took it from. He was transformed by Jesus and his message of care for those who are in need. The second part of this couplet is, is one that I think most of us would agree. This is, this is wisdom that generous people are happy because they give some of their food to the poor. Study after study has shown that people with less resources will give proportionately more of their income to those who need food or other resources for a living, whether it's medical care or, or help with rent, or that those who have less, they're, they're, they're proportionately giving more in resources to their neighbor because they see that need. And... The other part of it, I think we'd, we'd all agree that when you do are able to give, to share food with someone who's in need, you do have, you do have some benefit from that. You, you do have a sense of pleasure, of happiness from being able to help someone that you see in need. The last text from Proverbs that we read today is, is attributed to a group of writings that Solomon gathered. 
In 2004, a researcher found an Egyptian collection of wisdom sayings that are almost identical to Proverbs 22, verses 17 through Proverbs 24, 22. And so this third couplet that we're reading comes from that section, from verses 22 and 23. And it's attributed to Aminanope, or Aminanope, who is, you know, was an Egyptian ruler, who 200 years before Solomon's time gathered these sayings together. So it's thought that Solomon was using this wisdom and adding it to this collection in Proverbs. And this is what was written. Don't steal from the poor because they are poor. Don't oppress the needy in the gate. The Lord will take up their case and press the life out of those who oppress them. Well, to look at this scripture, it's, it's important to know some of the context and, and the, the understanding at that time was of being in the gate. Don't oppress the needy in the gate. What was behind that is the, the idea of the gate was that was a place where you went with your accuser to have a judgment made. So you, you're going to a judge in the gate to have a decision made in some dispute that you have. And it's saying basically when you're in that situation, don't take advantage of the person with, who is under-resourced. Don't, don't exact more from them than is due. Don't take advantage of that moment. Don't oppress the needy in the gate. We often hear examples of people who use their wealth and privilege to take from others when they are at a disadvantage. One example of this, you know, as I'm thinking this week about this, one example of this is check cashing businesses in Ohio. They charge an exorbitant fee that amounts to sometimes over 300% of the amount of cash given so that someone can make ends meet between paychecks. Basically what happens is somebody has some emergency or something, they have to pay for that and then they're trying to figure out how to put food on the table or pay for rent. So they write a check, give it to the company, they give them cash. But they don't cash the check until after they get paid. Well, they receive that money and then the check is for more than the cash they received and then that's coming the next month. But often people are under-resourced and they even have difficulty the next month with that check being cashed, then they find themselves short again. And so they continue the cycle with this and end up um, paying as much as 300% above that amount they've initially loaned. Another interpretation of the gate, this gate of the court, another way that we can interpret the gate is the idea of a gate that keeps people in and out. And so you have insiders in the circle and those who are outside the gate. And I was thinking about the scriptures today and we have the story of the Syrophoenician woman. This woman who was an outsider. She was beyond the gate of Judaism. And Jesus took the disciples beyond the boundaries of his homeland to go into Tyre. And there he meets this, this Greek woman, someone outside of the gate of Judaism, and she asks for help for her daughter. And she is possessed by a demon. And we, you might see that as possession by a demon or might understand it as mental illness, whatever the, the issues, the woman comes for healing for her child. Her child is in need. And she leaves the child at home and goes to Jesus, hearing that he's there and he's been healing people and she asks him for care for her daughter. And how does Jesus reply? This is one of those that's, that's a tough, tough reading from, of Jesus. Uh, Jesus responded that he was there for those inside the gate. He says, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So you would think, and he's saying, I'm, I'm not going to help you. And she answers him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And this challenge for Jesus and the disciples led Jesus to answer her, good answer, he said. Go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. 
when she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. You know, there, there are two interpretations of this, this story, and one is that, that Jesus uh, grew up, growing up thoroughly Jew- Jewish and living in that tradition, he saw those as beyond, as being outside of the faith community, and that he just responded to her as he understood that this was um, his, his life, his teachings, his healings were those who were for those who were Jewish. And that her challenge of him caused him to change, caused him to grow and to expand and to, to put together all that the scriptures say and teach that call us to those who are beyond the circle of inclusion to reach them. Another interpretation I was reading this week was that no, Jesus, Jesus had this understanding that God's love is for everyone, for Jew and Gentile alike, and that he purposely took the disciples out of their homeland and went to uh, Tyre hoping for an encounter just like this so he could teach them. And that what he did was he just parroted to this woman what he would have heard his disciples say. And that is, ah, this isn't for you. You know, this isn't, for you, you're not on the inside. This, it's not for the dogs. This is for the children of Israel. And that when she responds, challenging him, that he then is able to say, you're right. And with that, begin to teach the disciples that God's mercy, God's healing, God's goodness and love are there for all, all people beyond all gates. Well, however you want to interpret that and understand that with your understanding of Jesus, um, I think both are helpful in just knowing that, that that's how we're to respond to those in need, that we're to, to know that, that we're to be caring for all in the gates, beyond the gates. So I want to ask, you know, who are the people at the gates? Who are those people at our gates? Maybe it's people who are in the midst of the justice system, you know, and how are we responding to them How are we helping them find mercy and a way to life? Or maybe it's those who are at our gates in other ways. Maybe it's that person when we get off the interstate and pull in at the light who's there with a sign asking us for help in their need. Or maybe it's the other gates that are literally there in, in all nations where there are immigrants or refugees at the gates of many countries seeking to get in. Those who are in need around us, whether inside our circle or outside the gate, are deserving of our response to their need. I was thinking about us as a church, you know, and I've talked about this before, but blessing bags is one of those areas where where people kind of beyond the community, though they may come in and be a part of our church, but they're in our community, but beyond, beyond some gates, but we, we share resources. We share food with those who are in need of it, um, trying to make ends meet through the month, and we're helping out with that. Thinking of another place that I've served, one of the ways that, that we assisted people from within the, within the circle, within the gates, was when I was a chaplain at Heidelberg University. And Great Lakes Student Loan Foundation uh, was, was offering grants to schools. And our school approached them, you know, we, we applied for a grant from them. And basically they set, set all the parameters up for what, what was supposed to be happening. And that the need they were trying to respond to, they'd been, they, they've, they've been in business a long time. They're a nonprofit. So all their, all their resources, all that's come back in from student loans they continue to look at ways to give back to students and support students. And one of the things they found is that a lot of students, when they have an emergency in their family or something happens, that they have a, a car accident, they have to repair their car, pay the deductible, or they, have, they get sick and they're unable to work and then they can't pay their rent, 
that that emergency may cause them to leave college. And Great Lakes Foundation started this program of doing emergency grants, and they found that, that the retention rates where they go on to graduate from college went from under 50% for those students during those emergency situations to over 90%. And so they started giving these grants. Well, we applied, we got a grant of $60,000, and we started giving grants up to $1,000 to students who had an emergency happen. How many of you have had an emergency happen in your life? <laughs> I think everybody's hands should be going up. You know, that's, you don't plan on emergencies, but they happen. And often those things can take us out of what we're doing, uh, cause us to go into debt or greater debt, um, or even to lose housing or to lose a car, or all kinds of things. So. We started doing this, and uh, we saw our retention go from under 50% to over 80% through these grants. And then once the gr as the grant was running out, we started asking our alumni to give and sharing the stories of the kind of success that our students had. And then our alumni funded these grants, and they continue today. That's an example of uh, sharing resources with those who are under-resourced so that people can continue. You know, as I was thinking about this week, I started thinking, what would it be like for our church? You know, our, our church, I've heard stories of folks in our church helping other folks in the church out, small groups or just hearing people are in need and helping out. But I was thinking, how do you know who to talk to? How do you know how to ask? How do you know how to beg like the Syrophoenician woman when you're in that need? You know, and, and setting up a system or a way for people to respond might be something interesting for us to think about. Um, and looking at the research, you know, if it's, if it's $2,000 in savings, most people don't have that. Maybe that's what we give in grants, you know, a grant up to $2,000 to an individual or family going through an emergency. What would that be like, helping somebody going through an emergency to help get beyond that and to continue? Just some thoughts. No, no plans, no propositions at this point, but, but just it, it's had me thinking, and I invite you to think about that. The good news is that God loves us, and God provides for us all. Wealthy and poor and middle class, all in, in there, God provides for all of us. The resources we have were given by God. So how might we look at further ways to share those resources within our community and beyond our community. And beyond our faith community, beyond just this conversation, talking about here where we are, how can we bring those values around resources into our community and our government? How can we look at policies and programs and how they support these same values? And you might just start to say, well, it's different, you know, this is uncommon wisdom we're talking about. Some people live by a different ideal. You know, some people believe that, and they'll talk about this, the Lord blesses those who bless themselves. And this means that you take, take from others with no regard for other human beings. You just, you have, to, you have to go for it. You got this one life, do what you can, take what you can, and that's it. But that's not the wisdom of the church, and we don't hold in high esteem those who do that. That's the Proverbs that they call us to. That's what Jesus calls us to. Different values, different wisdom. The gospel values of Jesus, the Bible values of Proverbs remind us that we are called to share with those in need. And when we have also, and when we have a need ourselves, to be reminded that it is okay to beg for help. Like the Syrophoenician woman, any of those who came to Jesus for healing or food or teaching on wisdom, they came and asked. God's wisdom is uncommon wisdom. And I leave you with the question, how will you choose to live? Amen.
invite you to stand with us as we respond together in worship. Take 
go forth with God's blessing, and may your life be a blessing to others as you share resources, and may you be blessed by others as you ask for those resources that you need. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.